the light of the holy relationship. Do you want freedom of the body or, or of the mind? For both you cannot have. Which do you value? Which is your goal? For one you see as me, the other end. And one must serve the other and lead to its predominance, increasing its importance by diminishing its own. Means serve the end, and as the end is reached, the value of the means decreases, eclipsed entirely when they are recognized as functionless. No one but yearns for freedom and tries to find it. Yet he will seek for it where he believes it is and can be found. He will believe it possible of mind or body, and he will make the other serve his choice as means to find it. When I first read that, I just thought, oh, now it's, it's getting clearer and simpler because, you know, it fits. This kind of fits in for me with the whole metaphysics of the Course. That the whole purpose the world was made up was for the mind to run away from the pure abstract light, you know, that abstract oneness, and run into the concrete, into the specific, and become identified with form, to forget, dissociate from the light, and to even forget about the mind. Because I know when I was growing up, you know, there was all this stuff about, uh, you know, you talk about brains, and you can talk about bodies, and you can talk about the concrete and the form, but there wasn't a lot of discussion of mind, or it was one of those real hazy, vague kind of things to even talk about mind or thoughts or anything like this. And it's like, this paragraph begins to start to put this into perspective that, um, that which do you value, and which, where do you want your freedom, freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, that they're mutually exclusive and that whichever one the mind whichever one you decide is what's going to be your value and it's going to be your freedom whichever one you decide where the freedom is then you'll automatically then pursue that as as your end and you'll just use the other one as a means to reach the end and so I look at life I mean I look at my whole life and it's like that's in a sense, that's what I was doing, sleeping, in a sense of all of the, you know, all the years in college, all the education we do, all of the skills and abilities we learn with our mind, intelligence and everything, if, if, it, if that's seen as the means and the end is the body, you know, to buy bigger, better things for it, to, to shelter it in better ways, to pro provide more conveniences for it, more comforts, da 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 da, -da. And it's obviously the mind is like the means and it's being worked. And the, and the end is body, you know. And what this paragraph started to do is saying, like, you know, which do you want? You know, do you want to have a free mind? Do you want to be, have a free and open mind? To do so, you've got to have let the body be the means. I need do nothing section. And the first paragraph is the, the one that says you still have too much faith in the body as a source of strength. What plans do you make that do not involve its comfort or protection or enjoyment in some way? This makes the body an end and not a means in your interpretation. And this always means you still find sin attractive. No one accepts atonement for himself who still accepts sin as his goal. So it's like, I mean, that's, a, that's almost like a companion paragraph to the one we just read. So it gets back to that interpretation thing. What, how am I perceiving the body? As long as I'm perceiving it, the body is the end, then I'm, I'm misperceiving the body. And I still find, in a sense, sin is still attractive in that sense. It can seem kind of like, I can seem a pretty big stretch. Like, why why does it seem that if I see my body as an end, that, that I find sin attractive? <laughs> what, what, how does what, that connect? How does that connect? You know, where does, where does this stuff come in? You know, and, and it's the, it's, um, I think there's another paragraph that's come to mind that helps try to start to bring that connection back. It's way back at the back of the book. It's on uh, page 32 in the manual. Is it this name? 33 in the new book. So they're not too far off. Very close. Okay. So we're trying to make the connection like, well, what's the big deal about making the body the end? 
and the attraction of still finding sin attractive, you know, how is how is that sin? And what he's doing in a very specific way in this little section is he's he's starting to, to point out um, all of the things he gets pretty specific on of this world where the body is the focal point. It kind of the second paragraph starts out, it takes great learning both to realize and to accept the fact that the world has nothing to give. What can the sacrifice of nothing mean? It cannot mean that you have less because of it. Now here's where he starts to zone in a bit. There is no sacrifice in the world's terms that does not involve the body. Think a while about what the world calls sacrifice. Power, fame, money, physical pleasure. Who is the, quote, hero to whom all these things belong? Could they mean anything except to a body? In, a, in the worldly sense, power, fame, money, physical pleasure, they're all very rooted in the body. That's what all the striving about is trying to, to get ahead, you know, trying to move up the totem pole, trying to get more than the next person. Or the body is representing the separate self. Yeah. Which is what it does. Yeah. Even if you couldn't see that, you know, it may not be an enhancement for the body, you know, specifically. But a lot of times I think we try to enhance our image. Yeah. Of, you know, the separate self image which the body represents. Yeah. So that ties in with the body. In a sense, intelligence, you could throw that in too, in a sense that that's more of a mental kind of thing, but it's tied into that self image. Uh, yeah, our violinist yeah, strutting around trying to figure out who's better. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of things. relate to that. In a sense, you know, he's getting, he's using this to get at that meaning of, of sac sacrifice. Uh, I remember this year I was watching the, uh, before the elections, maybe it was the last year, I guess, um, where they had the Democratic National Convention and they have all the speeches. And there was a lot of that, we must sacrifice for our children and for future generations, you know, in, in many ways, you know, it's just noticing all the ways the sacrifice comes in, in the belief that somehow that there's a good benefit to sacrificing, you know. And it's still, when I listen to the speeches, it still had to do with better money, better jobs, better, you know, living quarters and everything. It still had to do with all these things, too. But here's the, the key points. Could they mean anything except to a body? Yet a body cannot evaluate. So right away he's ruling out the body and the brain because basically the, the body and the world is just a, it's like a learning device. All it does is it responds to the intentions of the mind. Bodies don't judge, bodies don't evaluate. Bodies don't even learn. They don't, you know, they don't even react in the sense that they're told to react. It's just kind of like a robot or a puppet that just responds to the intentions of the mind. Now we're shifting to the mind part, though. By seeking after such things, the mind associates itself with the body, obscuring its identity and losing sight of what it really is. So that's our key sentence right there, that that's why, um, the, when, by making the body an end, that's why sin is attractive, because, once again, the natural condition of the mind and the true identity is pure spirit. And it's purely abstract. There's no form connected with it at all. So once it starts associating with the body and with form and with the finite, then obviously it's starting to seek outside of itself. Obviously it's it's saying that it believes it has, has thrown away its its eternal home, so to speak, or its eternal identity, and it's gonna gonna cling on to and and attach on to this finite kind of a thing. And then the next sense really gets at uh, really gets at what happens. Once this confusion has occurred, it becomes impossible for the mind to understand that all the pleasures of the world are nothing. But what a sacrifice, and it is sacrifice indeed, all this entails. Now has the mind condemned itself to seek without finding, to be forever dissatisfied and discontented, to know not what it really wants to find. It's this profound confusion that the mind is, is just like completely turned around and twisted because it's it's um, it's identifying with something that it's not, and it's in doing so, it's completely throwing away all remembrance of 
his mental state. Where freedom of the body has been chosen, the mind is used as means whose value lies in its ability to contrive ways to achieve the body's freedom. Yet freedom of the body has no meaning, and so the mind is dedicated to serve illusions. This is a situation so contradictory and so impossible that anyone who chooses this has no idea of what is valuable. Yet even in this confusion so profound it cannot be described, the Holy Spirit waits in gentle patience as certain of the outcome as he is sure of his Creator's love. He knows this mad decision was made by one as dear to his Creator as love is to itself. The comfort in the last few sentences, because I mean, who, who has not experienced what he's talking about in these verses? I mean, that's, that's been our lives. <laughs> we devoted our whole life to, to doing, and it's kind of like it's backwards. And now he's telling us that it's backwards, but he's telling us that the Holy Spirit's in your mind. And he, he knows it's in the thing, but he's got this great patience. Be not disturbed at all to think how he can change the role of means and ends so easily in what God loves and would have free forever. But be you rather grateful that you can be the means to serve his end. This is the only service that leads to freedom. To serve this end, the body must be perceived as sinless because gold is sinlessness. The lack of contradiction makes the soft transition from means to end as easy as is the shift from hate to gratitude before forgiving others. You will be sanctified by one another, using your bodies only to serve the sinless, and it will be impossible for you to hate what serves whom you would heal. I think that's what, to me, the value of the Course is, that there's, there's just many forms of attack that are not seen as forms of attack. You know, that's, that's where the mind is, it's deceased state. I mean, it doesn't even know when, what, are the, what are the forms of attack. And, and what the Course starts to do is, through the special love relationship sections and, and various different sections in here, it starts to say you don't know all the forms of attack, but if you if you can get clear on that, then you can withdraw your mind from that. You know, you can, as Mason was saying, you can stop attacking yourself. <laughs> but until you, you kill yourself. Yeah. What a nasty idea. Until you get clear okay. on that. Yeah. How about this? When the body ceases to attract you, and when you place no value on it as a means of getting anything, then there will be no interference in communication and your thoughts will be as free as God's. Yeah, the paragraph, I have that one in a paragraph right before it on page, on the previous page, it begins with, in the holy instant, which is a few paragraphs oh. up. Oh, yeah. In the holy instant, where the great rays replace the body in awareness, the recognition of relationships without limits is given you. It's just what you were talking about. Relationships without limits. Mm -hmm. But, in order to see this, it is necessary to give up every use the ego has for the body and to accept the fact that the ego has no purpose you would share with it. For the ego would limit everyone to a body for its own purposes. And while you think it has a purpose, you will choose to utilize the means by which it tries to turn its purpose into accomplishment. This will never be accomplished, yet you have surely recognized that the ego, whose goals are altogether unattainable, will strive for them with all its might, and will do so with the strength that you have given it. It's just like, just slowly getting more accustomed to that sense of mind, that abstractness, that, <coughs> that, um, there's a part in the section.